questo è troppo. <ride> That's not good. Allora, sono molto contenta di essere qua. È la mia, la mia prima volta a Roma e questo è l'unico italiano che ci sarà in questa presentazione, però volevo <ride> dirvi ciao in italiano. E c'è una, per, una persona che devo ringraziare per parte del mio italiano, è, è Paolo, che è qua. Uh, abbiamo lavorato insieme. <laughs> ok, cool, so I'll try not to shout. Um, today we're going to play a game. And even though the name of the presentation was Hop on the Serverless Adventure, we're actually going to play the doppelganger game. And... My name is Simona, I just need to make sure this works. Okay, my name is Simona and I work as a cloud developer uh, advocate for Microsoft. And my role there is basically to make sure that the web community is happy on Azure. So we're making efforts on a daily basis to improve the developer experience in the cloud. And because I have a background in Angular and JavaScript and Node.js, uh, my community is the web community. But obviously, there's efforts across uh, different languages. So yeah, we're making Azure great. So this talk, <laughs> because I'm going to talk about serverless and machine learning, and Angular and single page applications. And I'm probably going to say, um, I don't know, maybe uh, web components and blockchain is not necessarily going to happen. But I thought that this is, since this is the buzzword of the year, uh, I'm definitely going to add it there. OK, and let's start with machine learning. So this is actually a poem that has been generated by the uh, by one of the Google uh, artificial AI algorithms. And basically, um, the data scientists fed in all the um, unpublished work of different authors. And this is what the AI thinks um, would be an interesting poem. And as you, can, as you can see, it's kind of depressing. So I'm not really sure what that says about us. But yeah, this is what uh, artificial intelligence thinks about poem. Poems. So a quick disclaimer there, I'm not a machine learning expert at all. Um, with this talk and with this presentation, I just wanted to uh, kind of see what I can achieve, where can I get to with machine learning and some of the tools that I already know. But before that, just to have a common vocabulary, like how many of you have looked into machine learning before? Okay, so there's quite a few. I'm happy to see that. Um, a quick definition for machine learning is um, it's a data science technique that allows computers to use existing data in order to forecast future behaviors uh, as well as outcomes and trends. And in other words, we're basically using machine learning uh, to teach where computers can learn without being explicitly programmed. So given some data, they will actually be able to generate new data without being programmed. And if we think in terms of uh, traditional computing versus machine learning, well, in traditional computing, what we're doing mostly is checking various properties, right? So if we were to look at a comparison between maybe oranges and cookies. What would be the first thing that we would check as programmers? Anyone? Like you could check for color, right? An orange is, has the orange color, and then the uh, cookie has like uh, yellow with brown. It's a completely different color. So then what about when you have a picture that it's in black and white? What do you do then? The shape. The shape is a very good argument as well. But what do you do with a, an orange that has been there for days and it doesn't look as great anymore? So obviously, there's different use cases. And 
for us to uh, go through all the use cases, we'd have to write like thousands of lines of code. Um, and the beauty of machine learning is that we, ha we only have to write code once, and then um, we use, we gather data, we use that data, fit it into an um, algorithm that will basically generate a model for us, and we'll be able to reuse that model for different data and different shapes of the data. So that's, the, that's my short version of my understanding of machine learning versus traditional computing. So then there's two different ways computers, or there, there's actually more, more ways of learning for computers, but two are like the biggest ones. And the first one is supervised learning. And with supervised learning, we're using patterns to predict labels, label values on additional unlabeled value, uh, yeah, data. And uh, the idea is here that you will basically submit uh, 100, 100 pictures with oranges that look differently. And then when we're running, when we're training the model, we're gonna, um, the algorithm is gonna use 70 pictures with their label so that it knows how to recognize an orange. And then 30 of those pictures, it will remove the, um, um, the label and it will test that it's guessing correctly and then you will see that data and be able to react to it. The 70 and 30 uh, numbers are just an example. You will be able to define um, what's the percentage of your labeled data and the percentage of your test data. So that's supervised learning. The other type of learning is unsupervised learning. And this is the obviously the hardest one because uh, we don't have any labels, and the, the, basically the algorithm is just left to find commonalities among its input data. And there's a funny story here that I read about, uh, which, is, which some of you might know. Uh, at some point, um, using unsupervised learning, um, some of the transactional data from supermarkets was um, fed, fed into uh, this algorithm. And one of the conclusions of the algorithm was that basically uh, most of the people who buy diapers will also buy beer. <laughs> so that's something that with our common sense we wouldn't have really thought of, right? And then what the, what the algorithm will do basically is tell us, look, I see these commonalities. I can group data in this certain way. And then from this, it's up to a human to actually interpret that data. So then we come in and say, okay, so I think we should maybe, whenever we're creating um, offers or sale or uh, sconto, uh, we'll have to uh, maybe offer a beer um, sale when we're selling diapers. There's other types of, so there's different um, strategies that we can take. And one of them is classification. So for example, we want to be able to build algorithms that will help us identify um, daffodils, for example. Um, another type of um, strategy is regression, which instead of looking at uh, categories, it will look at continuous data. And this type of data we can, um, so this type of strategy will help us identify trends. So if we want to look at stock markets or if we want to look at prices, like rental, um, this is the type of algorithms that we want to use. And finally, clustering, which was the example we saw before. The first two are supervised learning and then the clustering one is unsupervised learning because we don't actually have categories. We just know that we want to group data based on maybe some, um, some properties, but we don't know what those properties are. And if you want to learn more about how to choose uh, your, your algorithm on um, Azure Machine Learning, we have this uh, cheat sheet where you can see that we're starting from here and based on what type of data you want to see, so for example, if you want to uh, predict values, so see if the rental price in Rome will increase, 
then you definitely need to look at regression algorithms. And for example, in Azure, you will be able to choose uh, between any of these algorithms. And you will be able to um, always maybe test every two of them so that you can test their performance. At the same time, if you want to predict categories, depending on whether you're going to have two or more categories, you can use two-class classification or multi-class. And then clustering and anomaly det detection for things like um, credit card fraud, because that's, very, that's a very small number of people, like a small data, that you'll have to figure out which are the commonalities there. OK, so I mentioned in the beginning doppelganger, right? So what we're going to do is look at a doppelganger application that will tell us. Um, so for those of you who don't know what a doppelganger is, uh, it's basically when you find someone that looks a lot like you, like almost like they're, they're your twin, but you're, you've never seen them. You've nev they're never, they're not related to you. So I'm kind of exaggerating when I'm saying doppelganger because the only thing that we're going to do is just submit a picture of different people and see if they're similar to eight people from the 80s, which are like 80s characters from the movies. So our goal is to train data that will match fa faces and pictures to 80s characters. And you will have the opportunity to test this yourself. So this is an example where I, I um, submitted my um, a picture of mine, and um, it looks like I look 31% like Back to the Future. This was one of the early iterations where um, my data wasn't great, and probably now it won't perform like 100% correct, so you might look like a woman and I might look, look like a guy, but that's fine, it's just, it's for fun. So the first step that we need to take here is the collect the data. So what do we need? We, we need a lot of pictures with uh, characters from movies from the 80s so that we can train the data. Um, the next thing that we need is to iterate over that data, make sure we have enough of it and make sure that it performs well. So what this means is that we're going to submit pictures um, and then based on what we look at, and it seems to us seems to me that I look a lot like Lorraine Baines, maybe. And if the algorithm says something different, then I'm going to continue training it until it says what I wanted to say. And finally, the model deployment, right? You have this model, but you have to be able to do something with it. So you either want to be able to query maybe an API, an endpoint, or you want to run the, an app on your uh, like phone, you can do that as well. Maybe build a native app and include this model in your app and then run uh, the app itself. So which are the tools that we could use? Well, there's quite a number of um, machine learning tools and frameworks that, that we could use. Um, there's things like uh, Azure Cognitive Services and Tensor TensorFlow and Keras. Um, you might already guess which one I chose. Um, I have a lot of friends that know how to work with cognitive services, so um, I just choose the, chose the lazy path. And if you're curious, if you haven't heard about uh, Azure Cognitive Services, well, there's a, different, there's a lot of areas that we cover. So one of them is uh, vision, and there we basically have um, image processing algorithms to identify maybe um, what happens in a picture and then um, caption it. So you can imagine here, if you're building web applications and you need to have um, alt text, text for your images for accessibility, then you can run, um, you can send one of your pictures to these algorithms and they will send you back some tags for those pictures. And that can be um, the easiest solution for accessibility, for example. You can use language that's Lewis, uh, and Lewis will help you maybe with translating um, like text or speech to different languages. So for example, from my English now, we can look into translate to Italian. 
And there's a lot of other uh, services, but what we're interested in is custom vision service. And this is, uh, this is still in preview, but basically it's a tool for building our custom image classifiers. So we're going to be able to train an algorithm, a model that will use our images and then uh, like check the prediction for that. And the cool thing with custom vision service is that it has um, a very nice UI that makes things very easy. So in order to get started, um, I need a Microsoft account and also uh, images for training and some images for testing. So to build a classifier, uh, we need to create a project, select a domain, add and tag, uh, tag images, train classifier, and evaluate classifier. And that all sounds very boring now. But I'm going to show you how to... Has anyone seen custom service vision? Custom vision service. So there's one person there. Um, okay. So this is, this is how it looks like. Um, you have, uh, this is my dashboard, and um, you can create projects here. So I already have my doppelganger project, but then I'm going to create a new one just to give you an idea how, of how this work, works. So I'm going to um, create a new project named Code Motion, and then say this is a test, this is not required. And as you can see, we can choose from different domains. And uh, there's a general domain if you cannot put your data into the other ones. But the cool thing with uh, maybe food is that um, Microsoft has used a lot of data from Bing or whatever data we have in our uh, cloud to train um, these algorithms to perform even better. So if you cannot um, put your application in any of these, general is great. But if you can maybe minimize your domain, then it's much better. Your algorithm will perform better. So let's say that we're choosing uh, general. And then I'm going to use uh, my existing um, subscription. And I'm going to create this project. So then here I have a UI for uploading those images that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I can just click Add Images. And I already have some of the images I've trained before. So for example, I'm going to choose Emmet. Um, and I'm going to upload these images. And I'm going to tag them with Dr. Emmet. And I'll upload these pictures. And already, I have uh, some sample data there. And the next thing that I can uh, try to do is train this algorithm already, but it will tell me that it does need five images and it does need at least two tags. So I'm going to have to add one more image here um, because with all the machine learning algorithms, you need a lot of data. And uh, just uploading five images is already great. Uh, but probably if you want good accuracy, you want to upload m many other images. So I'm going to cheat here and um, upload random stuff. And this is going to be random. OK. Upload six files. And I need another image for Dr. Emmett, obviously. Okay, I'm going to add Lorraine in here and say it's doctor. So that's the beauty of machine learning. You can tag whatever with whatever you want, and it will give you exactly what you trained it to do. So now I can click Train, and this will uh, basically create a model that when, we'll see, when it will see pictures that look like Dr. Emmett, it will... Uh, recognize that Dr. Emmett is there. So we can see details like um, what the precision that we had. So for Dr. Emmett, it looks like 100%. We have 100% precision, and 33% of the pictures have been um, uh, have not been tagged correctly. Random, obviously, because it's random, it's, it doesn't do as great. And we can also run a quick test. So I can go ahead and add Emmett here. And it will give me 99% probability that this is Dr. Emmett. Uh, whereas if I'm going to add a picture of myself, 
probably it's not gonna be or maybe of Arthur so it doesn't doesn't identify Arthur at as any of Emmet or uh, random this is just an exercise um, so I've already created the other project doppelganger where I have um, like 169 pictures but you can already see the the problem here right uh, having to upload manually all those pictures how would you feel about that my, my, my first reaction to this was well I have a brother he's younger than me he tries to learn computer science so why maybe I can just ask him would you please make a list for me <laughs> and then make sure to upload five pictures for each character <laughs> and spend, like, spend an afternoon doing this. But then I realized that that's not how you learn computer science, right? Uh, so then um, we're going to see that there's, a, there's actually an API as well. So there's a prediction API. Once you train your model, there's a prediction API where you can send images um, and they will send you back similarities and percentage of similarities and uh, all of that. Um, you can also export your model to mobile. So you can either use TensorFlow for Android and Core ML for iOS um, if you want to build this as a native app. So this is that kind of sucks for uploading images um, manually. We need more. If there's an API for querying data, there has to be an API for inserting data, which is completely true. So what we need to do next is basically find a list of URLs for each tag, which represent images, and then send that list to our model to train on it. And here comes another cool technology there that I absolutely love. Uh, it's called serverless. It, and yeah, this doesn't look great. So how many of you here have, are familiar with serverless? Okay, there's a few hands here. Um, awesome, so serverless are basically, when you build serverless applications, um, even though it's the name is kind of weird, might suggest that you don't have servers, there are actually servers, it just means that you're not ha you don't have to manage them. So serverless basically applications depend on third-party services, so imagine many times you have to re-implement authentication for your user, or you have to implement implement user management, invoice billing, whatever. But instead of implementing those in your app, you could actually depend on third-party services like Auth0 for authentication, or maybe SendGrid for sending emails, and so on. And there's a second part to serverless where, say you depend on a lot of third-party services, but you also need to write some custom code because you don't write an application that only uh, integrates different services you want to be able to write your own code and that's functions that's known as functions as a service and that's what we're going to focus on today but just uh, I wanted to share with you this awesome animation that my colleague Sarah Drasner has created where she's explaining the evolution from infrastructure as a service when we used to only rent the hardware and then we moved on to also uh, getting from a cloud provider the whole operating system because we don't want to spend time um, updating an operating system. That's a task that someone else can do. So we can outsource that. We don't have to spend time and resources on that. And finally, we got to the tip of the iceberg where we're only writing our code and that's it. So a quick summary here. Um, when we're writing serverless code, uh, we're writing code that reacts to events. So those events might be HTTP triggers, or they might be so there might be maybe a message on a queue, or an uh, image being or a file being uploaded in a storage account. So say for example, you have a CSV that needs to be processed and uh, saved in a database. You're going to upload that CSV in a storage account, and then that's going to trigger our function to run where we're processing data, and then we're saving that data in a database. When we're writing serverless code, we're also writing code that auto-scales, because 
we're not using our own resources and we're not limited uh, by any of the choices we make. Like for example, when we're choosing platform as a service, um, we're choosing the type of operating system that we're using, the capacity, whereas with serverless, we're just saying, please run my code. So then if 1,000 events or 1 trillion events happen, our code is gonna run. 1,000 times one, or 1 trillion times. And the cloud provider is going to make sure that your code has the number of servers needed to run that. Finally, um, we pay only for the resources that we're using. So um, at, when we're paying for platform as a service, we are paying a monthly bill. It's like we're paying rent for the uh, hardware and operating system that we're using. Whereas with serverless, we're only paying for the CPU time and memory that we're using when we're running our code. So that allows us to be very fast. If you're building a startup and you want to build a, an application or prototype an idea very fastly, you can do that. Many times I hear, like when I hear serverless, I hear this, oh, I have to build something very, very fast. It has to be done in two months to replace a service that we no longer have access to and I'd like to try serverless. A few things that you need to keep in mind with serverless is that um, every function run is limited to a certain amount of time. So you can run a function for either five minutes or 10 minutes depending on the cloud provider. And this means that uh, you'll have to um, make your code be very small. Uh, like your functions, they don't have to take a very long time. Um, also, you cannot do infinite loops even if you wanted to. It's going to be timed out. And functions are stateless. So you cannot rely in between runs on anything that might be saved on the disk or in memory. And that's what allows us to scale like crazy. Finally, there's one thing that might not be great. Whenever we're um, kickstarting the code, that needs to run. Basically, you can imagine that you depend, uh, your, your code depends on some NPM packages, right? Or some Java packages or whatever. And your code needs to run somewhere. So in, in a serverless environment, it's just your code is saved somewhere uh, in a storage account. And once a request comes in, then that code is being deployed on a server the dependencies are being installed, and only after that, the execution will happen. And the time it takes for the code to travel between your storage account and it's ready to be executed, that's what we call cold start. And if you have a um, pattern of requests that isn't very, uh, isn't very different, then your cold start might not be very bad, but if you have huge spikes, then it's not great. So whenever you're building applications, you have to keep this in mind. If your application requires uh, to be very fast, to give fast re replies, then serverless might not be great. So with serverless, we get a simplified deployment. Uh, we have providers like Azure Functions, Lambda, Cloud Functions, WebTask, OpenWhisk. Functions and OpenWhisk are actually open source, so you can take the runtime and run it in your own environment, and that's great if you want to just test it. What can we do with serverless? Well, a hello world, just to be on the same page. This is just a function uh, written in JavaScript, and we get the first parameter of the function is a context object that allows us to communicate with the um, with the serverless runtime. So we can do things like log information. We can set a response for our request um, on the context. And we can also call done, which is the method that uh, tells our environment that we are done running our code. We can also create timer functions. Uh, those are like cron jobs. We run maybe um, on a monthly basis, we want a reminder to submit um, bell or a meter reading or something. We can also create webhooks. And webhooks are things, we can create webhooks for Slack or for GitHub or for whatever service. Um, this is something that I created. It's a Slack slash command 
that will go query the noun project API, which gives us icons um, that are released under Creative Commons license. So that's something we can use in projects. Um, I'm going to share the code with you later, um, like even now. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it's easy to see, but this is like this is the amount of code you need to write to get a Slack command running, and uh, most of the um, the big part here is just uh, querying the noun project API using a, the text that has been entered in the Slack command, and then setting uh, on context, like setting the response to uh, the images that we get from the noun project API, and then sending that uh, response back. We can also implement CRUD. Uh, operations. Obviously, we have the, the cold start, so that's where it's going to be most visible, but that's something you can do. So this is a project that I worked on uh, with John, Papa, and Burke Holland, um, where it's just a list of heroes. Um, and I have the GitHub here. I don't think I have the time to show it, for, to, show it to you, but we also worked on a plural site course, and it's, it's online. It's a play-by-play. -play. It's my first course, so that should be fun to watch. Uh, data processing. Sarah has worked on this uh, page where we show um, all the speaking engagements that we have in our team. And she used the location, which is the, the city here, to retrieve the longitude and latitude from Google, using Google APIs, and then um, added that as an input to this 3JS globe that uses those coordinates, and she made this beautiful uh, visualization. So that's another type of thing you can do. Uh, the demo is here. I'm going to share the, the slides. Um, you should check out the article she wrote on how she on how, how she built this as well. Okay. So I'm going to um, show you the demo. So. The things that we started with when we were at serverless, we said that we need something that will um, create a list of URLs for us and then submit those URLs to uh, our model. So a list of URLs. How do we get a list of URLs? Well, most of the times we Google stuff. But because I have access to Azure, I'm going to Bing stuff. So <laughs> Bing has this awesome API that allows you, oh, allows you to query stuff. So I'm going to quickly show you how that works. Uh, I can just look for maybe Lorraine Baines. And this is something you can try for yourself just going searching Bing Image search, search API. And you can try this yourself. So say that we want to search for Leah. Um, and it's going to give us a lot of images. But it, the cool part is that it's going to give us a JSON object as well, which we can inspect. And I have things here like um, the content URL. So I have the image URL. So you can imagine that what I've done is I've written a function that queries the Bing API. And um, as I mentioned, we can use message queues uh, with functions. So um, I'm very excited about this demo. I, I finished it last night, so I'm, I don't know how to contain it in Word. But basically, uh, the flow is I am adding a new message on, um, on a queue where I'm saying, uh, please help me find images for an actor. This is the list that my brother created. So let's see Darth Vader. So I can add this. And I'm also going to start um, running the function locally. But before that, I'm going to stop it in my um, browser. Actually, no. OK, so I'm going to run my function locally and add a breakpoint here just to show you what's happening. Train API, I have one here. OK, so I'm adding a message on a queue. And what should happen here, our function should be triggered. Um, and you can see that already I'm seeing some logs here. Um, 
Unfortunately, I wanted to stop on error, and we don't have any errors, which is fine. <laughs> um, but I'm going to show you the code for this as well. So the thing that we need to do here is send a request to the Bing API with the query term, right? And that will return us a list of URLs. So if I'm going to zoom here, you can see that I'm, um, I'm creating a request with the URL that of w for the Bing search. And then I'm adding a subscription key. And what's important here is that uh, we use a key that comes from uh, the environment variables which is stored in a file called lo local.settings.json. So I have here the Bing API key. Please don't use it. <laughs> and then I'm setting the method. I'm sending the uh, query item. So that's my queue, the queue message that I've just added here. As you can see, it has been consumed, so it's not here anymore. And then once that's successful, I am creating a new array that contains the tag, so the, the query, the word that I've searched for, and the URL of the image. And I'm adding that on a new queue. Uh, that's this custom vision queue. And you can see that how this looks like. So I have a message that has a name, so that's the word that I searched for, and an image that has been retrieved on the Bing API. So then the next thing that I need to do, I have, I have a bunch of URLs. They're all stored on a queue. And that will trigger a different function run that will submit those URLs to the machine learning model. And the function for that is this train API. The first thing, so um, the API only receives a tag ID, so it doesn't receive um, name. So what the first thing that I had to do was basically request um, from the um, um, custom service API the tags that I have available, uh, see if that already exists, and then get the ID, and based on that, submit the image. And I had to do a create tag as well. I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, so probably my model doesn't have new data now. Um, OK, and this is how we create a query to tag the image as well. We use a URL. We send a key. Um, we just send the tag ID and the URL. And the API will do everything for us. So this is something that I'm sure many of you have seen before, right? Submit a post request to an URL that has a body. And the body needs to have a tag ID and the image URL, and that will be uploaded in our, um, in our um, API. So that's OK. That's something. Um, let's see if it has been created. I don't think so. I haven't tried without a new tag. I don't know. It's not here. Okay, but is it clear for everyone how this works? How this works? Yeah. Um, and to test how this how this API works, I have created an Angular app, which you've seen earlier, um, where the only thing that you can do is upload an image, um, upload an image, and get the results. So. I can just uh, go ahead and uh, we've had a lot of fun on this. So this is Arthur, my boyfriend. Um, and I've uploaded his um, image, and he looks a lot like uh, either Lorraine Baines or Linda Hamilton. <laughs> so the algorithm, as I mentioned, the algorithm isn't doing amazing, but I think I need more data to train that. Um, and I'm, I can show you um, the predictions. So whenever someone is submitting a new picture here, I'm going to see what were the results that they got. So now I'm going to ask you to try the same. So I have this. The application is deployed uh, on Azure. 
and you can uh, just check it out at aka.ms slash 80s. And hopefully you'll be able to upload a picture of yourself or a person that you have on your phone and uh, get some feedback there with uh, who do they look like from the list of actors that I have in my uh, model. Okay. Do you still need the URL? Yeah? So it's aka.ms slash 80s. Mateo, what did you get? Did you get? Happy next slide. Woohoo! <laughs> so, ninety-six percent. Wow. Do you feel like a Marty McFly? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I will travel back, uh, back in time or in the future. If I do, I will let you know. Yeah. <laughs> if not, uh, maybe not. <laughs> so this is Mateo, and he's ninety-six percent uh, Marty McFly. This might, yeah, this might be weird because I, I will see all the pictures that you're uploading. I think I saw that, I, I said that already. Um, and you will see here the probabilities for each and single one entry picture that you'll see there. Awesome. Was that fun? Yeah? Cool. So then, that would be the end of my presentation. Uh, I have a list of resources here that you can look into um, and learn more about either serverless or machine learning. Um, not, not all of the machine learning links are here, so I'm going to share this on Twitter. This is me on Twitter, uh, if you want to see the slides. And I'm also going to share with the um, organizers. Um, if you're interested in serverless, there's a conference called Serverless Days. It used to be Jeff Conf, uh, but because Jeff was such a random name uh, and it wasn't very inclusive, it has been renamed to Serverless Days. And as you can see, there's one happening in Milano. It was, I think it was this year, uh, maybe in, or last year in November. There's also one in London and uh, in uh, Vienna. If you want to start a Serverless Days conference yourself, you can do that. You just have to um, go to that link and maybe write to the organizers. And I want to leave you with this thought. So we have, I, I, we have managed to look at an application that runs machine learning uh, by just writing maybe 300 lines of code, possibly, um, and reusing a lot of the servers, uh, services out there. So. My goal here was to uh, just showcase how powerful we are when we actually use a lot of the services that are out there already implemented by other people. So the thing that distinguishes the best, fastest, and most efficient engineering organizations is how little code they actually write. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I do have some stickers with me and some Azure passes. And if you have any questions, we can chat afterwards. Okay.